Hey, what's up y'all? Welcome to Game Day with Heavy Cardboard. Teach, play, and discuss medium and heavy strategy board games, war games, 18xx. I am your host, Edward Euler. Happy to be joined with y'all since it's another solo game day of Peloponnesian War, designed by Mark Herman, published by GMT Games. And a big thank you to a good friend of mine, Asher, uh, who let me borrow his copy of this so we could stream this for you guys today. I'm stoked about this. I did stream this last week. Um, it was about a four hour, one round play or one turn playthrough of it because I got utterly and totally eviscerated. But it was really entertaining and it taught the game, I think, reasonably well. So today, I wanted to play it more, so if I'm going to play a game, I'm going to stream it. So here we are. I wanted to play this more, so that's why we're doing it again this week. Uh, I'm doing the same scenario, but I guarantee this one will play out differently. I'm not saying it'll end up better. I'm saying it'll end up differently, so at least there is that. So welcome everybody watching live around the world as well as after the fact. Before we get started, as I am like to do, Big thanks to all the patrons who helped make all of this possible. Without them, this isn't happening. So a big thank you to all of them and to everybody that chooses to watch and enjoy the content here on Heavy Cardboard. So thank you. Speaking of which, if you do like this, give it a thumb down below. Subscribe to the channel if you don't already. And if you want to join the herd, get access to Slack, my teaching notes, and a whole bunch of other little perks, check it out over on PledgeHC.com. I certainly, certainly appreciate that. So yeah, Peloponnesian War, uh, the most unique solo game that I have encountered in a sense that we are going to be playing both sides of this. We're playing both the Athenians as well as the Spartans. In theory, we'll be switching sides. When that happens, uh, how well I do dictates that as well as a, a, a little bit of randomness thrown in as well. So if you guys are ready, I'm ready. I say we get into it. So without further ado, Mark Herman's Peloponnesian War. All right, I'm going to bring the chat down and the cameras down for a little bit. And here we go. All right. So what is it you guys are looking at? Well, you know what? Let, let's talk about the setting and the theme a little before we get started. Read the little introduction that they have here at the front of the rule book. Peloponnesian War is primarily a solitaire strategy game. Its subject is the prolonged conflict between Athens and Sparta for hegemony over Greece. The game system stresses the strategic problems that arise when a land power, i.e. Sparta, confronts a naval power, i.e. Athens, in a war of attrition, but where the interplay of strategy, economics, coalition warfare, and leadership determine the victor. As the commander of one side or the other, you attempt to bring a quick and decisive end to the war. The game system plays the part of your opposition. Unless you can end the war promptly, you will be forced to exchange commands and continue the war from the other side. Your performance will be evaluated according to your success in commanding either side, but the longer the conflict endures, the more you will be penalized at the game's conclusion. Thus. You become your own worst enemy in this tumultuous Greek drama. All right. So now, what is it you're looking at? Well, over here on the right, we have the game turn track. Now, you'll notice that we have the game turn set at six. Why? Because we are going to be playing the Decelian War, which takes place between the sixth, seventh, and eighth turns here. All right. I... I use the word round and turns interchangeably. In this case, I can get away with it because there aren't per se rounds in this game. So if I use the word turn or round, it prefer pertains to that. Then out here on the board, in theory, we have a victory point track sort of over here. I never got positive last time I streamed this, so I didn't use it. I just wrote the numbers down on my notepad. Uh, 
in theory, we'll be able to use this, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, then over here, we have the, uh, Athens and the heart of the Athenian Empire. And then down here, we have the Spartans here in Sparta and the heart of the Spartan Empire. Then the rest of the map surrounding the Aegean Sea. Now, the spaces are essentially take up, there are three different types of spaces dictated by the shape of the space. Now, the shape of the space here, whether it is, and as I said, I'm going to bring the chat and the cameras down. There we go. We're, uh, the square spaces are land spaces. The round spaces are island spaces. And then the triangles are going to be coastal spaces. Coastal spaces can have both naval and land units. Land spaces can have, you guessed it, land units. And island spaces can have naval units. All that kind of makes sense. In addition to that, there are lines of communication, all right, or LOCs. There are three different types of those. You have land communication, which are these two little lines that are connected to one another. Then you have the dots, which is naval communication. And then you have combined, which are both the lines and the dots inside of those lines. Now, what that's going to come into play with is for uh, being able to intercept either uh, both traveling for armies and units as well as for intercepting other units and other armies. More on that as we go along. So that's the heart of the map. And as you can see, we have a lot of island spaces over here in the southeast and a lot of land spaces over here in the kind of center area of the board. Then we have Sicily, which is going to be one of the big conflict uh, areas out here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then some other things around the board. We have kind of a legend for the map up there, which I've pretty much covered most of everything that's there. Then there is the going home box. So whenever troops are sent to the going home box, what means is they're going to come off of the spaces, come into the going home box, and then at a couple different points throughout a given turn, they will then be redistributed. These are not for eliminated units. These are for units that are going home. Eliminated units will actually go off the board and will be able to be re-recruited uh, re over the course of a game. Now, the last place, the last part of this map that I kind of want to bring your attention to is up there in the northeast corner, which is called the Hellespont. If you're familiar with your Greek history up here, this is actually, or Byzantine history, if you will, this is going to be a very, very important spot in this game. The Euxin up here is the uh, ancient name for the Black Sea, and this Hellespont. I'm going to give a little bit of history about this game and what's going on for those that are not uh, familiar with this. And this symbol represents the Athenian, Athenian line of communication source, okay? This is their food source. So indulge me a moment and let me talk a little bit about the history of what's going on. And I actually watched some shows, some historical shows on uh, YouTube for this, getting ready for this stream. Now, I'm not going to go into the history of why they're at war, so on and so forth. Basically, these guys were the big kids on the block, the Athenians were the up-and-comers, and this was inevitable that they would bump heads. As it is, both the leaders at the beginning of this war, so back in 431 here, both of the leaders and the populace and basically all of the various city-states around Greece expected this to be a typical Greek war. And what that means is these cities were surrounded by farms. And with that said, the majority of the way these things happened is if an army surrounded a city and sieged a city and took away their food supply, they would either starve or surrender. So what they would do is they would actually meet out in the field somewhere 
and have a battle. It saves attrition and basically it saves the farms from being burnt down and, and everything else and from their cities to be starved. And okay, you won the battle, you win and you know we'll, we'll pay some sort of tribute to you or whatever it is. However, this war did not take place because, like that. Main reason, well, the Athenians have what's called long walls. Now the Athenians here in Athens had a protected wall that went from Athens all the way to their port city of Piraeus, all right? Now, Piraeus was an important city for the Athenians because what Piraeus did is it connected them to their grain supply. And as you can see, there are lots of ways, Athens being the Athenian power, the, uh, the, the maritime power that it was, if they, as long as they had a line of communication or a travel path for their grain to get here, it didn't matter if the Spartans came and burned all of the fields around there, no big deal, they had their food supply supplied from up there. So these long walls, as long as those were not uh, uh, taken over by the Spartans, then the Athenians could play the long game and they could just wait the Spartans to get tired and go back home and realize that the status quo is how this is going to be. The Spartans, it, what they expected or what they were, what their plan was at the beginning of the war was if they, they try and take over Athens and they realize, oh, we can't do that. So Athens was in charge of the Delian League, which were all these city states out here. So their thinking was if they just, you know, cause a little bit of disruption with them, they're going to lose the support of these, and then they're going to join the Spartan side, and then eventually they will take over Athens. In theory, that's big picture what you're looking at. All right. So, how do you actually play the game? Well, the game, there are two other things I did not cover. <laughs> Sorry. There are two strategy matrices. There is one for Athens, and there is one for Sparta. Now how these work are, these are going to be the AI for the side that you are not controlling. In addition to that, you have the treasury for each side. So the treasury for the Spartans is 6,000 talents. For those wondering, I did look it up. A talent is a measure of weight of gold, approximately worth half a million dollars in today's terms about, give or take 100,000 one way or the other. But about half a million dollars is one talent. So, if you look at that, 6,000 talents, uh, it's uh, $300 million in their treasury, thereabouts, thereabouts, roughly, give or take, all right. Uh, so, their treasury, so for building units and activating units, then the strategy confidence index. Basically, am I going to switch sides between the two sides? And then their bellicosity track. Bellicosity, basically, how belligerent are they? How, how much is their, how their, their, their willingness to fight the other side? How strong is that? The stronger, the bigger that is, the more they're willing to just keep at it. The weaker that is, it's their will to fight. So think Vietnam War in some respects. So both sides have one of those. However, when I am uh, controlling the Athenians, I'm just worried about these tracks. I'm not worried about the top half of that. And when I'm controlling the Spartans, the same thing. And I will physically switch these out so we have those zoomed in for each side. So that's everything that you guys are looking at. And then there's a bunch of player aids and a whole bunch of chits off camera here, siege markers, rebellion markers, ravage markers, as well as other chits for units. So in addition to everything that I just went over, there is a player aid summary. Now with this player aid summary, there is the tur game turn sequence, which literally is all of those steps. It is very procedural and it is very important that you use this and go step by step by step. Now some of these are not going to take place in a given round, but it is important to not just gloss over this because there are little gotcha spots 
such as what I'm pointing at right here, that people will forget and then the game breaks a bit. So make sure you go through step by step by step by step all the way through every given round. With that said, I'm going to be doing that. I'm going to do it relatively quicker than I did last week uh, because I'm going to assume that some of you guys have watched that or are familiar with the game. And if not, I'm going to reference things, but I might not show you everything that I'm doing just for the sake of brevity, which is not my strong suit, I admit. But that said, there you go. All right. Now, a moment as I roll over my cord. I'm about ready to get started, honestly, and the only way that I know to teach this is to go step by step through the different phases. So it's going to be a teach as I go type thing. However, I do think that now that I have a couple of games under my belt, even if they weren't the smoothest or uh, most uh, strategic, I'm going to go over uh, the scenario that we're set up for and within the scenario, what it is my goal is going to be. So the scenario, as I mentioned, is the Decelian War. It takes place approximately from 416 to 408, all right? I start controlling the Athenians, which you can see down below is, I'm written, it's written in, or it's the green side, if you will. We start with a large force in Athens, a large naval force of eight ships, eight naval units in Piraeus, and then some up here in Kosira. We have some a little bit here in Chios, we have one naval unit in Napoctus. We have a fairly sizable uh, you, uh, group of units in Larissa. And we have an invading force over here in Syracuse. All right, then the Spartans, they start with a fairly sizable, this is a pretty big stack here in Sparta. And they also have the turncoat Alcibiades, the Athenian general has switched sides. So even though he's green, he's actually with the Spartans there. Then they have a massive naval force here in Corinth with their allies. They have the a large Theban force here of their allies. They have Plat uh, Plataea, a small hoplite force there. They have a small force in uh, Heracles. Then they have a tiny force way up north up there in Amphipolis, and they have a pretty big force here, uh, here in Syracuse. Now, one other thing before we get started that I think is going to be, uh, before we get started, is I want to go ahead and talk about the difference between Athens and Athenian allies and Sparta and Spartan allies. So if you take a look here, you're gonna notice a couple different colors. So you notice the red here for Sparta. It is a deep, rich red. And then you have kind of a, I don't know, kind of a rustish color here, a lighter red in, uh, for the Spartan allies. It is very much the same for both uh, Sparta as well as Athens with their allies. So if we were to go a little bit further north, and let's see, I think... There you go. You can see the troops up here in Larissa are a light green, whereas those down here in Athens are going to be a more deep green. So there's going to be a difference between Athenian and uh, Athens forces and Athenian allies and vice versa for Sparta and Spartan allies. And now it's important to note that Spartans will control all of their allies and Athens will control all of their allies. But when it comes to recruiting troops or where they go when they're here in the going home box, where they go are going to go to different places. That's going to be uh, pretty, uh, pretty important to note. All right. So without further ado, I need to fix one thing off camera. Give me one second and then I will be right back and we'll get started. Uh, I'm going to set the over under on glory to Rome's at two and a half. And I still need to go over. Give me a second, I'll bear it back.
There we go. Sorry about that. Had to fix a piece of tape for one of my player aids that's off camera. All right. So the last thing I want to go over is some other rules for the specific uh, for the specific scenario that we're playing. So the Spartans start out with uh, they are Syracuse is a Spartan ally. Macedonia is going to be neutral. So if any troop moves into Macedonia or into Pella, and Pella is the home of Alexander the Great, by the way, uh, then Macedo uh, Macedonia will uh, become a permanent ally to the side that didn't invade them. That kind of makes sense. Uh, there are a couple of casualties that have already died. So for the Spartans, we have Brasidas and Archidamus has died. And over there for the Athenians, Pericles and Cleon have died. Now, Pericles... Uh, died from the plague that happened here in the third year, I believe. So in 429, I believe. Uh, and Pericles has been criticized about having a very, very um, defensive strategy, basically playing the long game. And uh, honestly, I think what his, his, his strategy, I think, actually would have worked. But the, Athenian were, the Athenians were impatient. So, anyway, moving on. Sorry, getting sidetracked there. Uh, so, goal of the game, 40 points. 40 points for me by the end of the game. Now, the game will end in one of four ways. If I switch from Athens to Sparta, and then I switch from Sparta back to Athens, the moment I switch back to Athens, game over. Or an armistice occurs, game ends immediately. Or one side surrenders, or we make it to the end of the eighth round, or the third round, as it were. And then 40 points or more, I win. If not, I lose. The end. There we go. We'll keep the playbook out of the way there. All right. I'm stoked. Let me get some tea. English breakfast today, for those wondering. Yeah, seriously, I just don't want to roll a six to begin the game. I really don't. Uh, oh, real quick, I, I, I had mentioned I was going to talk a little bit of strategy. Just a little bit. I am not saying that this is the only option. It is not. And I am far from an expert on this. I played it exactly twice. So keep that in mind. And I will bring the cameras up now. So hold on one second. We have that one. We have that. We have that. And I'll bring it up here as well. There we go. All right. So I start as Athens. Now, I think the first thing that we're going to do, I'm tempted, I'm not going to, but I'm tempted as Athens to bring the force here in Larissa up through Macedonia and go after Amphipolis, okay? However, I think that's probably a bad idea. So I think what I'm going to end up doing is I think I'm going to end up taking a force from down here and heading up to Amphipolis because they're threatening my grain supply up there. However, realistically, the Spartans can't make it up there without pissing off Macedonia because they just don't have the naval force. They do here, I guess they could in theory, but I just don't think that's going to be a focus of theirs. So I think, but even so, I'm still going to take over or try and take out that force up there in Amphipolis. My goal is to win battles. Whenever you win a battle or a siege, you gain 10 points. If you lose a battle or a siege, you lose 15. So moral of the story, don't lose the damn battles. So, so that's going to be uh, plan number one. Plan number two, this battle is going to take place in theory already, so I'm actually going to let that take place because we have naval superiority over here in Sicily. So I'm just going to let that play out and not mess with the troops that are over there. And I think early on, I think I'm going to come over, grab some troops here in Chios, and head on up to Amphipolis. So that's going to be my early strategy. And then for the Spartans, if I were to switch sides, uh, what I'm planning on doing is taking out Nopactus right away. 
uh, and then working my way up to Kosira to try and hurt them financially at the end of the first turn. Because if I can take out Kosira and I make it up to, I forget the name of it, it is Epidamnus. If I can make it up there, they're going. Uh, the Athenians are going to feel they're going to lose a 1, thousand, 1, fifteen hundred talents uh, of their income, and that is a massive hit to their ability to make war. So I think that's what I'm going to do. Plus, whenever you activate units, it costs you. There are some exceptions to this on the Spartan side, but it costs two hundred for a land unit, four hundred for a naval unit. So because Athens is primarily a naval uh, force, if I hurt them that badly up there, then that's going to be a massive hit. So that's what I would do if I am Sparta, okay? So there you go. Nope, I'm not gonna mulligan if I get a six on the first roll. I've thought about it. I'm not gonna lie, but I'm not gonna. So let's get started, shall we? So we'll call it 1245 when we're actually getting started. Uh, any other questions for anybody out there watching? I'm curious because I know not all of you guys have watched the previous stream. And it might sound a little intimidating, but actually, if you follow along with the player aid and you do everything that it says, you're actually in pretty good shape. Now, I did make uh, some handwritten notes to help myself to make it a little bit easier. I do have some... Uh, a couple of the things that are linked down below, the player aid, as well as the sequence of play. The sequence of play, I'm actually only using four pages. I think it's pages four, five, seven, and eight. And what those are, are the roles for everything, and for battles, and for interception and skirmish, just so I have that up and I don't have to look through any sheets out because I don't have them all committed to memory. And then I'm gonna primarily be using the player aid that I have linked below for walking us through our steps, but I also have the rule book if necessary, okay? All right, cheers. So, let's get started. So, the very first phase, political phase, side determination segment. All right, switch sides if, you're, if the SCI uh, if the side that you're controlling, if the SEI, the Strategic Confidence Index, is equal to or above zero. So let's look. My SCI is currently at zero right here. Okay, so we're going to have to roll. If the adjusted SCI is six or higher, you switch sides. So because this is zero, you would add whatever number it is if it's above zero. If it's below zero, you can't switch sides. All right. So we're going to roll the Athenian die and an adjusted die roll, which isn't adjusted in this case, of six or higher, so six, I would switch sides. I did not switch sides. That was really close though because it almost came over, but it didn't. So therefore, I've determined what side I'm going to be. I'm going to be Athens for the first time, for the first turn. All right, that's done. See, easy. Now, the event se uh, segment. I'm gonna roll both dice and then figure out what event we're going to have. Okay, so here, we'll keep it here. We'll roll both dice. That's uh, event number three. So now we need to grab the little event table that comes with the game. Event number three is the oligarchs rebellion in Athens. All right, well, that doesn't sound good for me. Ignore this event unless Athens has a negative SCI and Alcibiades is currently with the Spartans or Persians. Okay, I don't have a negative SCI, so therefore can't do it. So if we can't do it, we need to re-roll. There has to be an event. Okay, and it also says that can only happen once per game. Uh, same with uh, event number five and six. So we roll again. Three, we roll again. Five, Persia enters the war. Well, we've already changed things if that's the case. Ignore this event unless it is turn five or later. It's turn six. Now, it's important to note that I, I had talked to Mark yesterday or uh, before our stream uh, last time. I said, ah, I'm just going to put it on turn eight, and then that way it's clearer for everybody. And he said, no, don't do that because certain things have certain timings, and so this does matter. So even though we're playing a scenario, all of these timing things still apply. So therefore... 
because here in Persia, we are in turn six technically, okay, we are turn five or later, good. Spartan bellicosity is six or greater. Grab that one too, hold on. It is at six, so okay. Uh, and Arshib Alcibiades is currently with the Spartans of Persians. He is. Guess the Spartans or the uh, Persians are coming in. Ain't no party like a Persian party, and a Persian party is good, something like that. Okay, this event only occurs once per game, so I guess this is the only time this is going to happen. All right, Sparta receives 500 additional talents each administration phase. Uh, let's see, uh, Morgis, a Persian contender for the throne, is in rebellion. If Sparta later captures the Iasis space, Place three Spartan ally cavalry strength points, I'll cover those as we go along, into Sardis, and Sparta begins receiving an additional 500 talents each administration phase. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, you guys might be asking yourselves, self, where is Iasis? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I ain't got a damn clue. Let's see, it's in 7D. Across the very top of the edge, is a numbered sequence and down, or uh, like a map coordinates, right? And down the right side are letters. So 7D. So I, uh, Iasis is going to be, let's see, 6, 7D, I said. So it should be somewhere out here. Seven delta, Iasis. I'm looking. Delta should be right in here. So it should be. Oh, come on. Where is it? Oh, right here. That's Iasis. Okay. So they're going to receive an extra 500 talents each administration phase. Now, I'm going to write this down. Okay. Uh, and then. If Sparta later captures this space, there, place three Spartan allied cavalry there into Sardis, and Sardis is, you would think it would be right close by, seven Charlie. So Sardis is going to be right here. We're going to place... Three Spartan ally cavalry here, and they get a total extra thousand. Wow, that's good for them. At least it's not terrible for me because them making it over here uh, when they don't have a whole lot by way of ships. If I become Sparta, damn Skippy, I'm going to be doing this. But as it is right now, not a plan. So here we go. All right. So we are done with the event. So. Moving on. The Delian League Rebellion segment. Okay, so what is that? That is, implement event eight. If the Athenian SCI is less than or equal to zero. It's at zero. I guess we're going to implement it. Okay. So I will go to page nine in the rule book for the details on this. If rebellion occurs, execute event number eight on the event table. It can never occur to or spread to a space occupied by a friendly force. If a friendly occupied space is generated, re-roll until you have bad things happen. Okay, event number eight happens. Oligarch rebellion in the Delian League. Oligarchs plan to remove their city-state from the Delian League and crush the forces of the Demos. All right, now the Delian League is headed by the Athenians. The Peloponnesian uh, League is headed by Sparta. All right, so roll two dice, adding them together. Seven. Seven. Uh, Mytilene. So when a, uh, a da, 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 da. place a rebellion marker in Mytilene. And Mytilene is... 
6 Bravo. So Bravo, up here in 6, it's going to be up here, Mytilene, right there. Isn't that the same place we got last time? So, when a Rebellion marker is placed into one of the above spaces, Roll a die for each adjacent space, which also uh, rebels on a result of six. Okay, so what is adjacent? Well, we have uh, Mythima and Tardras and Arginues. Go with it. Those three. So we're going to roll any sixes. So we'll start up here rolling around. So we'll go one. There's a... Uh, so the A spot, or the first one is, the second one is not, and the third one is not. So we have one rebellion spread. There. All right. That event is done. Oh, it's the most, oh yeah, because seven is the most likely whenever you roll two dice. I guess that makes sense. All right. Now, leader selection segment is the next step. So, uh, place one random leader in Sparta and Athens. Sparta has one, Athens does not. So, let's go ahead and show you guys that a little bit closer. All right, so you'll see there is a leader, Aegis, who starts in Sparta, that's part of setup. There is not one here, however, in Athens. So we're going to grab, there are four left possible. All right, so we will. And we have Formio. One other thing that I want to talk about and just to mention it, and then I will go over the details of what they might mean here in a little bit, but each leader has two ratings, a tactical rating, which is the top number. So Formio's case is a tactical of two, strategic rating of zero. And you'll see that Aegis has one and one, okay? One other thing to note on this is if Nicias is in play, you're supposed to turn the game turn marker over to the plus one for Nicias, and he is in play. As you guys will see here momentarily, he is actually uh, going to be having a battle over in Syracuse. So there's old Nasius. He's part of setup as well. Okay? All right. So that is the end of the political phase. Done. That wasn't too bad, right? All right. Strategic planning phase. All right. Strategic determination segment and then the confidence reset. All right. Strategic determination. All right. So... What that means, we need to move this out of the way now. Ooh, that could have been bad. Uh, the non-player strategic determination says, if the non-player uh, SCI is greater than zero and you didn't switch sides this turn, keep the current strategy. Okay, it is not greater than zero, but I didn't change, uh, uh, I did not switch sides this turn. So we're not going to keep uh, the same uh, uh, strategic determination. In other words, what's the bot going to do? What's the AI going to do? It starts out and cause rebellion. Uh, so because it is not greater than zero, yep, determine a new strategy. We're gonna roll a die and add to it the strategy rating of the non-player leader occupying its home space. Okay, so occupying its home space. So we take a look. The strategy rating, the bottom number is one. So we're going to add one to the roll. And this is Sparta, so we'll use the red die. So that's going to be five plus one, which is actually a six attacking Athenian ally. So that is going to be their new strategy, okay? Actually, it w it's technically seven. I apologize. And the reason for that is because Alcibiades is on the Spartan side. If so, you add one more. So it actually was a plus two. My bad. All right. So we have now 
Strategy determination, done. Confidence reset. Turn everybody's SCI to zero. Done. Okay. Cool. Now we actually get into the meat of the game, which is operations phase. So you can see, that's actually pretty quick. That's, that's relatively not bad, right? I think. I suppose I ought to leave that there so we actually talk about it. The player side initial operation, then the non-player side initial operation, then continuing operations, and then this is important, which a lot of people miss, going home segment. So I will do mine, then the bot will do theirs, and then we may do more and more and more and more and more of those, and then anybody in the going home box will go home. Okay? So I go first. All right. The world is my oyster. So I said earlier what I was going to do if I am the Athenians. So I'm going to stay on target and do exactly that. So for my first operation, we're going to have with this, this little marker down here, which says operation objective, you have to set an objective on where it is you're going to go. So I'm going to set my objective of Amphipolis. So I'm going to put this up there to show that that is my objective. Now I have to declare how big uh, of a force am I going to send up there? Well, let's see. If I don't want to piss off the Macedonians, I have to go via sea. If I go via sea, that means if I carry any troops, that my ships can only carry troops on a one-to-one -one basis. One hoplite or one cavalry can go on to one trireme or one naval strength. So what I think I will do is I will send a strength of three and three up there. But now I need to pay for my activations. So it's going to be uh, three naval units. So those are 400 apiece. So that's 1,200. And it's going to be three land units, which I'm going to do a mix of hoplite and cavalry, but I'll, I'll cover that in a little bit. So that's 1,200 for the three naval, and then 600 for the three land forces for a total of 1,800. So I need to spend 1,800. So I went from 7,000 to 5,200 there. Does that make sense, hopefully? All right. Then... The leader that is in Athens is who is going to uh, run the operation. You don't have a choice. It's going to be that leader. So Formio here is going to be the leader that I have to choose. Now, let's take a look at the stack that is here in Athens. He has two cavalry and three hoplites there. Those are strength points. So when I say there are three hoplites, that means there are three strength points of hoplites. So I, I'll be honest, I don't know what the size of the force represents, but I imagine they're, they're sizable forces here. And I should also mention that there are eight naval here in Piraeus. Okay. So I said I'm going to have a total of three and three. So that means I'm going to take three naval there. A moment while I think about this. I'm going to take one cavalry and one hoplite from home, and then I'm going to grab the hoplite that's in Chios here and pick them up along the way and then head on up to Amphipolis. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit of detail of how this works. So Formio has to go, every space that he picks up troops at are called assembly spaces. And he must do so according to the lines of communication. So in other words, if it only, if it's an inland space, an inland space like here in Larissa, you cannot leave troops behind and then come pick them up later you either have to assemble on the way or you have to go get those troops and then come back. And what I mean by that is, if I wanted to grab the troops here in Larissa, because of the fact, and I will actually bring this up a little bit uh, closer so you guys can see this. 
So if you look here in Larissa, you'll notice that that is a land communication, all three directions coming out of Larissa. So in order for me to pick up these troops, I, they can't meet me on the coast. I have to actually have my leader come in along with all the other units that they have picked up. Well, ships, naval, cannot move inland. So therefore, they cannot pick up any of the units that are there. So therefore, what would have to happen is he would either have to travel by himself or pick up any of the units here in home, then travel via land up to Larissa, possibly getting intercepted by other armies or other uh, forces here, pick them up, then travel back to Piraeus to then pick up ships. So that's why I've decided to take some of the troops from home and some of the ships here to go out to Chios so I don't have to mess with getting intercepted up here. Okay, there you go. Spartan hoplites are a thousand men and all other are two thousand because the Spartan hoplites were badasses. That makes sense. So hopefully that kind of makes sense why I'm doing this the direction that I am. So let's get back to it, shall we? So getting back to this, I said I'm going to choose to take one cavalry and one hoplite. Well, you'll notice that there are two cavalry here. So, oh shoot, I cannot do that. Because that is the only Athenian cavalry shit in the game. All the others are allied cavalry. So you notice this thing's empty. This is the Athenian cavalry. You know it because it's written on it. Not really, I'm just saying that. But you'll notice it's empty. So therefore, uh, change of plans. I'm going to... Uh, now I understand why they didn't send any cavalry up there. All right, fine. I'm going to send three hoplites instead. I don't want to take this cavalry and reduce all or take all of the cavalry here because the line of uh, the uh, interception distance of cavalry is longer than it is for hoplites. So I might be able to damage the Spartans if these guys stay here. So instead, I'm going to take hoplites. So I'm going to take these two hoplites and leave the two cavalry and that hoplite there in Athens. So I will leave them there. So I will grab Formio and those two uh, hoplites, and then they're going to travel down here to Piraeus right there, where they're going to pick up three ships. Now, thankfully, there are plenty of ships, Athenian ships, to make change for. So... I will turn one of these twos into two ones, which you are free to do, and I'm going to grab three ships. So it's going to be a two and a one. So then these guys are going to stay stacked up there in Piraeus. Those will join in Formio or grab there. Okay? Does that make sense? So we now have assembled most of our force, but not all of it, because now... We need to actually head on over to Chios, and that's probably a little far, so let's bring this over. There we go. Now you guys can see it. So, from Piraeus to Chios, you must take the shortest path possible if there are possibilities of the enemy intercepting. There's no Spartan forces in between here, so it doesn't matter how I chose, but I'll go ahead and count it out nonetheless. So coming from Piraeus probably goes one, two, Aegina, two, three, four, five spaces there, or it could go one, two, three, four, five, etc. We would have to randomly figure out which direction we do not get to choose if there was a possibility of interception, but there is not. So boom, Formio has now made it up there to Chios. He now is going to bring in the Athenian ally hoplite, and now my force is complete, three and three. So, the hoplites will go to the bottom, the naval will be on top, and the reason I do that is because the interception range for naval is further, or is longer, so it makes more sense to do that. So now, we have to take the shortest path again for, to head on up, all the way up to Amphipolis, okay? 
So, the shortest path here, whoop, doesn't really matter because again, Amphipolis only has one hoplite, okay? And the interception range of a hoplite is its own space. So it doesn't reach any other spaces whatsoever. So if you take a look, because I'm going there, when I reach that space, there might be an interception, but how I get there doesn't matter because there's no Spartan force up there. So we're not gonna waste time trying to count that out and measure it out in the whole nine yards. So we're just gonna take this stack and we're going to now move it on up and they are up here in Amphibolis. They have reached their destination or their, their objective. Keep rolling over my cord. There we go. Now that they have reached the interception or their objective, because there is an enemy unit there, there may be a interception, okay? So because they have entered the enemy's zone of interception or ZOI, okay? They now have to roll. So, because it is a Spartan interception, we will roll the red die. It doesn't really matter, but again, just trying to keep it thematic. So, a one to three, the interception fails. A four to six, it succeeds, and then we're going to have a skirmish. One to three fails, it failed, nothing happened. Boom, that's it. That is the end of the objective. So, that's done. That is now the end of the player side initial operation segment. Hopefully that made sense. Right there, that is done. Now we're going to go to the non-player side initial operation segment, which is the exact same, only different. So, let's take a look at this after I get a drink. Are you guys able to follow along? Is it, is it moving a little bit smoother today? All right, first things first, you always have to read, or if you don't have it memorized, like I don't, you need to check and see if there are conditions for defensive strategy first, okay? That is the priority. Then if not, then we're gonna do all this other stuff. If an Athenian force, i.e. a green force, is within two spaces of Sparta, it's not, okay. Connected by land or combined LOC, lines of communication, a Spartan force of 10 hoplites and one cavalry must have that space as an, as an objective. Well, it's not. But if more than one space meets that requirement, the Spartan force is sent to the closest space and additional forces are sent to other spaces until each Athenian force that meets the requirement is in the zone of uh, interception of a Spartan force. Okay. JT says, I'll actually re-roll if I use the wrong color dice. See, I'm glad I'm not the only one that would do that. If the Corinth or Thebes space is occupied by an Athenian force, a, well, let's look. Thebes, nope. Corinth, nope. Okay. Then uh, 10 hoplites, one cavalry must have the space of an objective, da 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 If Syracuse is within the zone of influence, or I say influence, but same thing, zone of influence, zone of uh, interception, it's the exact same thing in this case, in this game. If Syracuse is within the ZOI of an Athenian force, uh, yep, it is. A Spartan force of 10 hoplites and one cavalry must be used and conducts an attack Athens strategy to generate an objective. So in other words, it's going to do a 10 hoplite and one cavalry, and it's going to do this. Okay, all right. Uh, possibly Christopher. All right, so we need to have 10 hoplites and one cavalry available to assemble. All right, well, let's find it. How can we do this? 10 hoplites. Well, a moment. I will spread these out a little bit for you guys. 
those are liters. Yep, that's all of them. Okay. So, let's take a look here first. So you'll notice that there are two cavalry and two hoplite there. Two cavalry, two hoplite, and then the rest naval. Okay, so we have that. And coming over here to Athens and Sparta area, we have one cavalry and four hoplite. Now, these hoplites right here where it says 3HG, those are the home guard. They stay in Sparta and never leave, ever, no matter what. They're there to defend Sparta to the death, so they will never leave. All right, now, the AI always must take from the closest space from Sparta and then go from there. However, they are not allowed, unless they are forced to, meaning there are not any other options on the entire board, they are not allowed to take the last of a given unit from a space. So in other words, even though there are four hoplite and one cavalry, they are not allowed to take the cavalry and they are only allowed to take three hoplite total from this area because uh, the, the, they have to leave one hoplite here and one cavalry. And you know what? I misspoke. Since they're leaving the three home guard, I believe they can take the four. Here. So they can't take the cavalry, but they can take the four hoplites there. So that means they need a total of six more hoplite and one cavalry. Well, they have five hoplites right there that they can take. Well, they can take four of them in theory. But then uh, they can take the cavalry from up here, I think. Yes, they can and they can take some of the uh, hoplites from up there. So, they have to start at home, okay? Okay, so let's get back to this. If Syracuse is within the zone of interception of an Athenian force, a Spartan force of 10 and one must be used and conducts an attack Athens strategy to generate an objective, okay? So, an attack Athens strategy. So even though it says 10 and two, this it says we're gonna do the 10 and one instead, and now we need to roll the red die to figure out where we're going to go try and attack uh, which of those three cities, okay? All right, so we're gonna grab the red die, we're gonna roll and see what city we're gonna, they're going to attack. One, they're coming after Athens. Now, this is not going to be good for them, but, Oh, it's okay. We do what it says. So they're going to, the objective is going to be Athens, okay? So we're going to put this there in Athens. So it's going to be 10 and 1. So we know that the leaders and both leaders are going to come, both Alcibiades and Aegis are going to come, have to leave the cavalry behind. So we're going to take the four hoplites because we must per the AI, there. And now they have to uh, assemble, they have to continue assembling as they go along. Now, it's important to note, all of the Spartan ally hoplites are on the board. However, we can make change, okay? So this one is allowed to make change like up here if need be, whatever. Uh, can we? I don't know that they can. Hold on. Um, so we have four. Uh, hold on. So if they pulled four, that would leave one. I don't think they can do that. Because those are specifically... Spartan units, and those are not Spartan allies, so you can't make change between the two sides. So, again, I ran into the same problem on the last playthrough here of making change there when it comes to the five and five there in Corinth. So a moment while I try and figure my way out of a paper bag. Um, all 
Oh, hold on. I see what we can do. No, we cannot. I lied. So we have another three here and a one or two there. So if we were to take four, we would take three. No, I cannot take from Corinth. There's no way to make change. To lead, yeah, there's no way to make change, to turn that into a four and a one. So, so how do I do this? So I can only take four from here. If I went up to Thebes and If I took three from there, and then I come down to Corinth, and I grab two from here, that's nine. I need to take three, seven. I need to take three. That would leave two. That would work. I think we can do that. I think. JT, feel free to chime in. I'm trying to do the math to be able to because there are no change. And the other side of the five is a three. So if I were, so I need to be able to, so if at the end of all of this, I need six between them. If I take three and three, if I took those three, that leaves one there, that's legit. Then if I took three here, that would leave two, but I can't leave two <laughs> because I can't make change. Ay vey. I think, no, it doesn't, because I can't, ma I can't leave these guys behind. Oh. The only way I see this working is if I have to go grab. I, I feel like an idiot right now, but I can't figure out how to make that work. Let me make sure that I have them set up right. Corinth is five and five. Thebes is four and four. Plataea uh, is one, one, Amphipolis is one, Syracuse is two and two and three naval. So if you can't make change, you can't take the extra with you. Um, or do you just not do the operation? I don't think I can do the operation. I think I have to pass because, and here's why. Because specifically the operation calls for hoplite and cavalry and not ships. This is actually a really good thing, Lawrence. I'm glad you brought this up. So because I'm not allowed to pull the last one and I cannot make change. So that gives me four and three is seven. And I can't make change here. Because I can't make change, I cannot pull the guys that are here in Syracuse because that would require me with the leader to go grab them with a boat. I'm not allowed to take naval. So I can't make change, so therefore the operation doesn't happen, so Sparta passes. To the best of my knowledge, that's how this works, because if you cannot, just like what Lawrence says, uh, if you can't make change, can you take the extra with you, or do you not do the operation? No. Well, hold on. Check that. Because you are allowed, if you're forced to, take the last one. That. Okay. So you are forced to, because if not, if it would cause a pass, so therefore we can do it. Okay. So let's get back to it. There we go. Like I said, I had to think my way out of a paper bag. Sorry, guys. So, 
Let's bring them back to Sparta. So they're going to come up here and grab all five in Corinth, and they're going to go up to Thebes and grab one and one. Okay? Okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Remember, you can take them all. If, yes. Yeah. I, I read that after the fact, JT. Thank you. So the going to Corinth, there is no interception. There's not going to be any allies that are going to be able to reach. And I'm going to move the objective marker there. So cavalry have a, uh, a line of interception of their space plus one more over land. In other words, they can reach Panactum. They can also reach uh, Decelia. But as it is, I'm going to Corinth, and the shortest way is going to be up around this way or up through here. Um, and should also point out, Argos is technically an Athenian ally. That's, for all intents and purposes, a green space, okay? So what that means is it would be ravaged if we were on our operation, but we're not on our operation yet. We are still uh, assembling. So we're going to take uh, Aegis's force and move it on up to Corinth, and he's going to grab the five troops there. So we're now up to nine hoplites. We need 10, and we need one cavalry, which we're going to grab up there in Thebes. Okay. So now we need to look. So Thebes is actually this space right here, okay? So to get there, the shortest path going through Pegea is one, two, three, four, or 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 one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. No. So it's going to be one of those four directions. Now, because there are cavalry here that can intercept there in Panactum, I am not allowed to just willingly say, oh, I'm going to go this way and avoid them. No, no. You cannot actively avoid that. You cannot, you're not also not forced to go there. Randomness is your friend. So we're going to call this uh, direction one going up that way, two, three for the intercept, or four for the intercept. So we're going to roll an Athenian die for this. And that's going to be trip number three. If it had been a five or a six, I would have re-rolled. So three means Aegis's force is going to go one, two, three, four. So he moves, poop, poop, and stops because there's going to be another interception now here between those. Does that make sense? I hope. And now, does the interception succeed? I need to fix this again, damn it. Doing a poor job of taping. There we go. All right. So, interception. One to three fails. Four through six, there will be a skirmish. One through three fails. The Athenians failed to intercept, so they didn't see him from Athens going through Panactum. So, he just continues along. There's no other interceptions that can happen between there and Thebes, so he's just going to move on up there. He's going to grab one of the hoplites, and he's going to grab one of the cavalry. And the cavalry, because we do have change for those, is going to grab that. And that one cavalry, then, will go on top. And now, he now has his full force assembled there in Thebes. dun da da, -da. There's the Spartan, for, uh, Spartan force. So now, the, their uh, destination is Athens. So what's the shortest path following either land or combined lines of, communi uh, lines of communication? What's the shortest path to Athens? So let's see. It looks like we could go one, two, three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. So it's going to go down here. So we don't need to roll because it's uh, one, two, three, one, two, three. We are going to roll. Uh, no, we're not. It doesn't matter. Uh, hold on one second. Be 
because we're about to ravage. So, when ravaging, There it is. Okay, it is not enemy controlled, so it doesn't matter. This space, Platea, right here, is not, uh, this is, uh, it's controlled by the Spartans right now, so therefore we're not gonna ravage it, so it doesn't matter which space we go to, because technically they're both red spaces right now. But when we get to Panactum, on our way to Athens, we have possibly another interception. So again, here we go. That is a successful interception. Picked off. He's running it back. All right, I'm, I'll try not to make that joke too many times. I'll try. So therefore, because there is a successful interception, we're now going to have what's called a skirmish. And a skirmish means both sides are going to roll their die. And if they roll a one, they're going to lose a unit. So we will roll both sides. Just going to set that down gingerly. Both sides rolled a five. But now we're not done with that roll. So even though neither side lost any troops or any units, we now need to see whether or not there's going to be a battle. If this number was 11 or higher, there, uh, so an 11 or 12, there would be a battle. It's not. Or if, depending on the type of space it is, the shape, so this is a land space. If it were a land or a coastal space, if the total number of land strength points between the two units was eight or more, and at least half of them were from the intercepting force, there would be a battle. If it were a naval space, same thing applies, but for naval strength points. So again, we know that there are 10 uh, land strength points in this stack. So now, if we look, there are a total of three total strength points for a total of 13. So that is bigger than eight. However, not half of those 13 are the Athenians. So in other words, the Athenians are like, nah, just kidding. <laughs> uh, those Spartan guys. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no battle, because they're like, nope. Now, if they had, so 13, if they had at least seven of them, then there would be a forced battle. It would be a land battle, obviously, because it's a land or coastal space. But as it is, they are not. But it was a, and this is important, it was a successful interception, which means there, this space, which is Athenian, if it was a failed interception, remember that first roll where we rolled a four through six? If we had failed, there would be a ravaged marker which is going to affect the income that Athens would get for that space. But because it was a successful interception, even if the skirmish failed in a sense that there were no casualties on either side, it doesn't go there because the interception did happen, okay? All right. So that is done. They then continue to move to Athens, but now there's a final interception here because it's a new space. So Athens again will roll and it failed. Because it failed, they're going to get a ravage marker in Athens. I, yeah. And they have reached their objective so therefore, their initial objective, uh, Hans. So real quick, let me get back to that and answer that question. Hans is asking about the long wall uh, zone of interception. During the combat phase, the cavalry cannot, do not have a plus one for their normal zone of interception. But because we are not in the combat phase, that does not apply here. We're in the movement phase, so therefore it does not apply, so they can intercept in that space, okay? All right. All right. So, 
that is the initial Spartan non-player side initial operation. Continuing operation segment. All right, what's that? Well, let's go back to this. So we're going to turn Aegis's units sideways, or if you have cubes or some sort of marker, you can put a penny on top, whatever you want. Some sort of marker to show that they have been activated already this turn. We're also going to do the same here with Formio. We're gonna turn them sideways to show that they too have been activated this turn. And the reason we're doing that is you're allowed to take multiple uh, object or operations. However, if whatever units have been activated this turn can only be activated once. So therefore they cannot be uh, activated multiple times. So now it's going to be the Athenians turn. Do we wish to continue, or, uh, continue operations? Yeah, all right. So now we need to check the auguries. In other words, we need to see if the gods are in favor of us continuing operations. Now, because I am the player, um, uh, a moment. Jonathan says, uh, why no ravage on the failed intercept up north in Amphipolis? Because it should have? Yeah, because it's actually controlled by, it's enemy controlled. It should have. Good call. So that ravage marker, because the Spartans failed, that actually goes on there. Good call. I just forgot. You're right. There we go. All right. So we need to see if the gods are in favor of us continuing operations. Because I'm the player, so the player side takes the number of leaders that are on the map, physically on this piece of cardboard out here, including the going home box, which I got wrong last time, but Mark corrected me in time. You count the number of leaders, so let's look at the number of Athenian leaders that are on the board. I would also argue that uh, Alcibiades is not Athenian anymore, he is Spartan, so I'm not going to count him. That makes sense to me. So I have Formio, I have Nicias. that's it. So I take the number of leaders, divide that by two, and round down. So two divided by two is one. Okay, so I add that to my roll. A roll of six or higher, adjusted, uh, and the auguries are bad, and I can't take any more operations. So in other words, a five or a six. Oh, we can continue. All right, excellent. So, continuing operations. That just means do the same thing again, if you, you know, but, uh, you know, obviously not using them up there. All right, so what do we want to do? Um, Now, just because Aegis is here in Athens does not mean that he is going to prevent us from being able to take any kind of actions. Your troops are allowed to move through uh, areas uh, during assembly, um, so not a big deal here, okay? Oh, yes, gah. God bless it, hold on. I'm glad you guys are on the ball today. Because apparently I'm not. Oh no, it's not ravaged because there's enemy units. Durr. Ah. I'm a dunce. My bad. Yeah, there's enemy units there. So you can't ravage it. Okay. Also, I did not pay for the Spartans. You are correct. They're activations. Thank you. Let's back up real quick. All right. So the Spartans... You never have to pay for activating hoplite or cavalry that are Spartan. Nice. So let's take a look. Well, here, let, we know. It's going to be six allied uh, hoplite and one allied cavalry. We know this because we took four from home. So therefore, that's going to be a total of seven units. That's 1400 bucks they got to pay for. So one, two, three, four, five, six change out of the 2,000 they just paid. So from 6,000 to 4,600. There we go. Mm. 
Oh yeah, so this won't be ravaged either. I'm an idiot, Jesus. All right. No ravage here either. Gah. All right, there we go. Yep, there we go. All right, glad you guys are on the ball. So what do we want to do? You know what? Honestly, I'm considering just wrecking shop and What if I took What if I took one cavalry and three ships, sail around Sparta, ravaging as I go, and go stopping here in Irenaeus? Or stopping in Panormus, actually, I think, because I'm still going, no, it would have to be Irenaeus. No, naval, I would have a range of two. And I could, anything that happens here in, Cor oh, sorry, that should be there. Yeah, Irenaeus. I'm right. I think I like that. Because this siege is going to fail by Aegis because we have lines of communication up to the Euxin. Um, so therefore, what, this is not going to be, a, this is not going to go well for them. Um, so I'm really not worried about it. I like that idea. Any, any opposition? What do you guys think? I like the idea of taking one cavalry, leaving the hoplite and one cavalry, jumping on three ships, and then just all the way around and trying to ravage all these spots all the way around. Yep. Uh, hold on, but sieging, the only problem with that is I need the hoplites, don't I, to siege. It's got to be five or more. Ooh, hold on. Oh, no, 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 no. No opposing units are present. Yeah, that works out. Hell, I don't even have to. Yeah, we're going to take a cavalry. I like it. All right. So first step is we need to, there's no leader in Athens. So we need to have a general. We need to have a leader. So we're going to grab one of those. And that is going to be Thessalus. Damn it. Again, I can't make change of the cavalry. I guess I'm taking them both. Or I could take the hoplite. We'll take the hoplite. So there. And then, moving on down to Piraeus. And JT, here's a question for you. Because you have Aegis here, can't, I don't think he can intercept Thessalus on his way down to Piraeus because of the long walls. Am I correct in that? I was going to stop in Irenaeus. I'm not going all the way to... Yeah, I'm stopping in Irenaeus. Yeah. Oh, I need to set that. Oh, but then again, I'm within... Yeah, actually, we'll stop there in Panormus.
because otherwise we're going to be within the zone of influence of those five ships. And let's not do that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think, let's see, uh, Siege Determination. No, no enemy zone of influence of any time extends into Athens or Piraeus during any phase. All right, good. So I'm good. So he's then going to pick up three ships. Because again, it's free of zone of influence from that. Okay. So now the shortest distance. So, basically, we got to get to the Cape, uh, uh, Cape Selam. So, the shortest is going to be to Aegina, Mathana, and then the Cape. All right? So, we have now done all of our assembly. We're going to zoom out a little and then move this down. There we go. And... Actually, we'll move it back up as we need. So we'll do that. So he's going to go to Mathana. And every space he hits that is red, we're going to have a ravage. There. There. Then the next is there or there or there or there. So we need to roll between these two sides, which direction we're going to go because it ships. So we could go either to Idra or to Trozen. Okay. So uh, one through three will be here. Four through six will be there. That was terrible. One through three. So going there into Trozen. And then over into Hermione. I, I, how do you say this damn word? I know, it's Harry Potter. So the shortest path is not going to be in this way. It's going to be down to Preze. However, as soon as we reach Preze, we're now within the zone of influence of Sparta. Okay? So the Spartans are going to try and intercept. One through three fails, four through six succeeds. That failed, so because it failed, in other words, they didn't see us, there's going to be a ravage there. So now, here in Epidaurus Lemura, the, that is not within one of there, so we're going to ravage there as well. And again, now we're going to have to roll for either Jithium or Scythera, so... One through three will be the, that one. Wrong die. Same. All right. Makes me feel better. So, now because he went there, could be another intercept here. Hermione. Thank you. Go with it. Hermione. I'm still going to butcher it. Hermione. Why is there an O? All right. One through three is an intercept. No intercept. So we ravage, and I butcher my force. They got hit by a storm. The tweezers don't work very well for stacks, I've noticed. They go down to Cape Tanarum. And now we're going to move back to Caron. Another intercept might take place. Nope. Down to a scene, over to Pil Pylos. Uh, let's see, then it goes one, two, three, four, five, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, no. One, two, so he's gonna come out this way. So that's, a, oh, hold on, we lost our spot here. There we go, that's a little bit better. And we'll move it on up. Move it on. A little Jefferson reference. All right. So we're out here, and then we go to Cephalenia. Now, that is a neutral space, so we will not ravage that. 
and then the shortest one from there is not going to be to uh, celery. So instead it's going to go there, there, there. And we have reached our objective in Panormus. So out of that, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven ravage markers. That's 550 bucks or 550 talons. And again, half a million a piece. That's gotta hurt. Okay, so that's good. That seemed like a successful operation. That I, I'm cool with that. So now they're continuing operations. Now, they still have to reference the auguries. They have to check with them. Plus one if it's the non-player. They are. So that's plus one. Then plus another one with the leaders divided by two rounded down. So let's take a look at their leaders. What do we have out here? Do, 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 do. They have one, two, because remember, switch sides, three. Three divided by two is one and a half. Round down is one. So... They're going to add one for being a non-player, one for having uh, two or more, or two or three leaders, as it were. So, in other words, on a four or higher, they're done. They're not done. Auguries are with them. So we take a look at the strategy here. Okay. If an Athenian force is within two of Sparta, it's not. Okay, so we can skip all of that. If the Corinth or Thebes space is occupied by an Athenian force, it's not. If Syracuse is within the zone of interception uh, of an Athenian force, a Spartan force of 10 and 1 must be used and conducts an attack Athens strategy. It is. However, 2 four, two, four, sorry, two hoplite, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They only have eight hoplites on the board that are available that have not been used. Oh, I missed a ravage marker. I did because that would have been the shorter path. Good call. Thank you. 12. All right. So because Syracuse is within the zone of interception of an Athenian force right there, they're supposed to muster 10 and 1 again, just like what this says. However, they cannot. If they cannot, they pass. So they're done. All right. So now it comes back to yours truly. And I should turn these guys sideways to show that they are done. They have moved. I'm pretty happy with where we're at, I think. Um, What I'm doing right now, um, what I'm thinking now is what I'm looking at is if I put a leader here, which I have to if I'm going to have an operation, right? Uh, do I come up and grab some of these Larissa troops and bring them down to Heracles? So what I'm looking at is what, what path would my leader have to take? Because I want to take the leader by himself. I do not want to leave Athens undefended. I will not. So, so I'm looking at the path that, the, that he would take. And unfortunately, once you make it up here into Histiaca, or I'm sorry, Histia, here, it's naval or naval. So I cannot go on to Euboa, onto the island here. So in other words, coming from Athens, if I went one, two, three, four, no. And you do not want a leader by himself because if so, 
If he's captured, he immediately goes into the going home box if he's intercepted by any of these forces. So I don't see any realistic way of getting these forces from Larissa by themselves, uh, getting the leader up there because of the fact that they're landlocked. Um, oh, hell, yes. Ah! Yes, Tiago. Right here. This spot is land. Whoop. Good thing I didn't have an interception there. I had to go this way because it ships. Damn it. It doesn't change much. It's just, again, you got to be careful of the long, uh, lines of communication, the type. Because this is land only and because I had ships, it has to go the naval way. Good catch. Thanks. You think so, JT? JT says, go ahead and leave Athens undefended. Long walls keep it safe. That is true. As long as I have the Hellespont. Should we go crazy? Try and take over? Uh... You know what? What the hell? Let's do it. Let's go big. Let's try it. So we have to check the auguries first. Auguries. Number of leaders divided by two. So we have one, two, three, so it's one and a half, so it's one. So on a five or six, I have to pass. Okay, apparently the auguries say, nah, go ahead, do it. Okay. So we need to draw a leader. There are two leaders left to draw. And our leader is oof, Thrasa Bulbus, Bullus, Thrasa Bullus, Thrasa Bullus. <sighs> okay. So let's do a little figuring route. So JT says, take the leader down to Piraeus, grab a ship, and then go siege something by Sparta. It's an option. The other option is to take my two cavalry, come on up here and grab the troops there in Larissa and come back to Heracles and siege that. Kind of like that. It's risky, though, because the shortest path would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 1, 2, 3, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ah, maybe that's not so bad. One, two. It's riskier. But I, I hate the idea of leaving. I guess I. He could just go by himself and grab one ship. Huh. It's just so risky because I'm going to have so many interceptions coming up through here to go grab those troops with Larissa. Um. I think I probably ought to try and do that early on if I am still Athens next round to go grab them. I think that's probably the smarter choice. So, all right, we'll follow JT's suggestion. So, uh, our objective, all right, so the Helot Re Rebellion, what cities? I know it's Pylos.
Pylos, Corone, yeah, it's those five down here. It's one, two, three, four, five. I guess we could, I mean, I guess we could just siege one of the coastal ones, one of those, right? I mean, all I need is a boat to siege it. So, all right, pick a city, guys. Since these are already ravaged, I don't need to go far, right? I mean, we could do just praise, eh? Yeah, so, yeah, let's just say we're going to siege praise, eh? Because they've already passed. So let's do it. So we're going to head there. We're going to turn these two ships into a one and one. It's going to leave the troops there, no interception there in Parese and Athens. So he's just going to boogie on down, so here we go. So from Piraeus to Aegina, he's not within there, so we're good. He makes it all the way safely, all the way to Parese. However, there is cavalry here, so possible interception for him. So, there is an interception, but there was already a Ravage marker. So now, both sides need to roll. And as long as I don't roll a 1, he did. However, you'll notice, Spartans rolled a 1, the Athenians rolled a 6. So, the Spartans, because this is a coastal space, they are going to lose one hoplite if possible. They cannot. So instead, the next one is going to be one cavalry. So they're going to lose one cavalry here. So I'm going to set this aside to make note of what they've lost. So I'm going to put it on their board, actually. That's going to matter for later on. Then, at that point, it was a successful uh, uh, interception on a coastal space, but they died, unfortunately for them, but good for us. Uh, bear in mind, you'll leave at least one strength point there at the end of the turn, so if you leave them next to the Sparta, they'll send 10 uh, defensively next turn, which could stop them doing something else. I'm okay with that. Let's see what happens. Let's okay with it, Lawrence. So the total roll was a seven. So it is not an 11 or higher and it's a coastal space. So there's not at least eight land units between them. There was only one. So therefore there's no battle. That's the end of it. We have reached our destination and we are done. The Spartans have already passed. I think we're going to stop at that point. We're not going to continue any more operations. Oh, hold on. I needed to pay 400 for that. There we go, for activating that ship. There we go. All right, so that is done. So we are done now. Continuing operations is done. And now anybody that was sent to the going home box would have to go home, but there is nobody. Way different than the previous game. Completely different. Okay, but it's important. So if I had, you had, uh, somebody had had to go home, they would have come back to their respective spaces. Keep that in mind. Now we go into the combat phase. Now is when the long walls of Athens come into play, okay? 
Siege Determination segment. Okay. So, Siege Determination. During this segment, examine every fortress space currently occupied by an army that is enemy to that space and place a siege marker there if either of the following conditions apply. Either there's no opposing unit there, place a siege marker underneath the army. Okay, so let's take a look at that first. There, the Athenians here, there is a Spartan force there, so we'll skip that, we'll come back. However, here in Preze, there is not an enemy force, so we're going to put a siege marker in that location underneath my units. Because it does have a fortress on it, okay? All right, so then, uh, ta -ta 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 -ta, that is a neutral space up here. And that's it for that part of it. And because there are enemy units there. Okay, the second part of this is, if there is an opposing force without a leader, and it's present, and your army has at least five SP larger than the opposing force, place a siege marker atop the opposing force, then place your army on top. Okay, so let's go over these again. So let's take a look over here in Sicily. Without a leader, there is a leader. So the Athenians are not sieging Syracuse. In other words, this will not be a siege. This will just straight up be a battle. Does that make sense? Because there is a leader. Okay, all right, so now let's go ahead and move around here. All right, now there is no leader in Athens, so you would think that there is a siege that is going to take place with Aegis. However, there is a special rule, the Long Wall of Athens. During siege determination, which is where we are right now, in each of uh, Athens and Piraeus, the situation is automatically a siege if the space has been designated as an objective and is occupied by a Spartan army, Un which is, unless there are at least, uh, unless there are at least three more Athenian land SPs than Spartan land SPs. There aren't. However, if the Athens space can trace a contiguous line of spaces not controlled by Peloponnesian League forces, i.e. Sparta and its allies, to the Euxine uh, line of communication source, in other words, the Hellespont up there, the siege automatically fails. This line can be traced through a space even if a Spartan army is besieging within it. Siege fails. So, what happens when a siege fails? You might be asking. Remove the besieging army to the going home box. Then replace the siege marker with a ravage marker. However, not in this case. And reduce the besieging side's SCI by one for a non-player, two for the player. Okay, so in other words, this whole stack here is coming on down to the going home box. So all of that was a complete and total waste of time for the Spartans because of the long walls. You would have thought they would have learned by this point not to do that, but it is what it is. Now, we reduce their, ooh, shoot. Okay. We reduce their SCI by one. Okay. All right. So any other Sieges, not here. That is a successful, or a siege is going to happen here. That is a neutral space, so that will not happen. Oh, up yonder. Okay, so let's take a look up there. Let's go back now to this. So looking at that, no opposing units. There are opposing units. So an opposing force without a leader, well, 
the Spartans do not have a leader there. Okay, checks out. And your army is at least five SPs larger than the opposing force. Well, let's look, shall we? Now we can turn these over, or straighten them up, as it were. That sure looks like six to one. That's five. That's a siege. It's almost like I planned it. So we're going to put the siege marker on top of them and put our army right on top of that. That is the siege determination for the entire map. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Yeah, uh, Mark says, uh, always says that the dumb moves by the AI that are doomed to fail are pretty historically accurate. Yeah, they, uh, they, they learned, though earlier on, I will say, they did learn here. They tried to do this and then realized, oh, these long walls thing. During the first Peloponnesian War, um, those weren't there. The a Athenians said, uh, we ought to probably do this. And when they did, the Spartans realized it fairly early on in the war. So anyway, I digress. So that is siege determination. Let's go back to this one. All right, now, battle resolution segment, okay? Then, siege resolution segment, then, going home segment. All right, so battle resolution segment. All home spaces without siege markers, occupied by units of the both sides. Nope, nope. Next option, coalition spaces without siege markers. Yep, all right, time to have that happen. Let's get it on. Who is that? Mills Lane, wasn't it? Boxing ref back in the day. Those are the two forces here in Syracuse. All right. So we have to determine what type of battle. If there are both naval units, naval battle will happen. Then, potentially, there will be a land battle, okay? So as it is, we're going to have a naval battle. Why? Because there are naval units of the Spartans and the Athenian Navy. So, Athenians were masters of the sea, Spartans, not so much. All right, so here we go. Both sides are going to roll dice and compare their roles. However, there are... Uh, Dice roll modifiers. If at least half of the Athenian force is Athenian Navy, let me try this again. If half of the Athenian Navy, if the force, the naval force, there we go. If half of the naval force for Athens' side is Athenian and not Athenian ally, it's 100% Athenian in this case, they get a plus two because they kick butt on the ocean and, or in the water, and the Spartans do the exact same, but on land. Okay, then who has more naval? So we have a total of four here versus three there. Four minus three is one, so Athens gets a plus one. In addition to the plus two that they already got, they're now at plus three. And then their leader tactical rating, the top number, so plus zero, so Athens gets a dice roll modifier of plus three. However, the Spartans get a plus two because, uh, who is that? That is uh, Gallippus, who is a bad mofo, uh, gets a plus two, okay? So, there we go. Come on, Athens, roll well. All right, so that is a plus two, that is six. <laughs> Three plus three is a six, so it's six to six. That is the outcome of that. The outcome of a naval battle now, the side with the higher modified roll wins. So six to six, nobody. In case of a tie, the side that contributed the highest positive non-zero tactical rating wins. Glory to Rome, Gallipolis, or Gallippus. You, God, I suck at rolling dice. <clears throat> so a moment, 
while I write down a minus 15 points for the Battle of Syracuse. Golly. All right, so there's that. The loser has to eliminate the number of its enabled SPs equal to the difference, the smaller of the difference of the modified rolls or the number of naval uh, SPs on the winning side. So the difference in rolls was zero, so don't lose any units. However, uh, if the winner of a naval battle has a number of hoplite strength points equal to um, Oh, actually, hold on one second. Hold on, I don't lose the 15 points yet. I won't mark it yet. The loser loses ships if need be, but not in this case. If the winner of a naval battle has a number of hoplite strength points equal to or greater than the loser's hoplite strength point, minimum one. So in other words, he has two hoplites, I have four. If the winner of the naval, so in other words, the Spartans, have more hoplite strength points than the Athenian, both surviving forces immediately conduct a, uh, a land battle. But as it is, he has two hoplites, I have four, so it is not bigger. We will not conduct a land battle. In other words, if they were stronger on land after whooping our butt at naval, then they would continue it. But as it is, they say no, no mas. All right, so. Otherwise, so this is the otherwise, all surviving SPs, land and naval, and leaders belonging to the losing side are placed in the going home box. Yay. Take the long sail of shame. The CSU suck. All right, so that's done. Then increase the winner's SCI by one. Whoop. Reduce the loser's SCI uh, by one, unless the winner began with an overwhelming force of three or more. In other words, they should have crushed, and they should have, so now that will drop to one. The end, that's the end of that battle. Yeah, seriously, this is, this is amazing how badly I roll. So the Spartans defend Syracuse. We will put this stack back up. Any other non-siege battles? Let's see. There's a siege here, and there's a siege up there. So nope, that's it for the battle resolution. Now we go into siege resolution segment. All right. During this segment, first remove the siege marker from any space that no longer contains a besieging army. Well, we don't have that problem. Then resolve a siege for each space still containing a siege marker. All home spaces, then coalition spaces, neither of which, and then all other spaces. Um, and then randomly. So whether it's that one or this one, I'll just start at the top and call it good. So we're going to resolve the top siege space first. Oh, so it's your fault, John. Okay. Um, I disagree on that, JT. So what JT says, I think you lose the 15 points right after the naval battle, uh, and then following the land battle could cost you another 15 points. It's two separate battles. I would kind of disagree with that. Um, I hear you. But this is technically a combined. If you read, and here, you know what? I will actually, not arguing, I'm just arguing, I guess, but, or disagreeing. So check it out, okay? 
So right here on 6231, when you win a naval battle, da 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 check that. The side with the highest roll modified wins. Then you go to 6231, whichever is less. Then if the winner here, otherwise you do this and check for and lose the points in a whole nine yards. However, it doesn't say you do it here, you do it otherwise if it's not a combined battle. If it's a combined battle, then you don't do, or if it's not a combined battle, you would do this. If it is a combined battle, you don't do this, and you go down to conducting the land battle, and then after that, you go through all of this where you lose the points. So I think, I think you're penalizing yourself too much. I mean, I'm all, it, I'm all about uh, masochism, JT, but, uh, but I, I, I don't think so. But I am willing to be convinced otherwise. All right. Oh, wait, wrong thing. Up there. Siege resolution. So here we go. Let's spread out the force now. So we have, oh, yeah, that's pretty clear. There we go. This is the siege of Amphipolis up here. Okay. So the besieged has an advantage if they have more naval. He has no naval. I do have naval, so the besieger has the advantage, okay? If the besieging army has a number of naval SPs equal to or greater than that of the besieged force, I do. Roll a die, adding the besiegers, meaning mine, tac leader's tactical rating, uh, then subtract two if it's Syracuse, so I'm not subtracting. So the tactical value here of Formio is two, so I'm going to add two to the roll, and in this case, we need to roll a two or higher for it to succeed. That succeeds. So on a one to three, the siege would fail, but add two to it, so two or higher. So I actually rolled an eight, so that's good. Siege succeeds. Eliminate the besieged force. Notice it did not say move it down to the going home. It's not out of the game, it just goes back into here so that it can be re-recruited at the end of the round. Okay, all right. So then, replace the siege marker with a ravaged marker if there already wasn't one, okay. And now we put the ravaged marker there and take the siege marker off. Reduce the besieged sides SEI one unless the fortress was neutral or in rebellion. Well, it wasn't neutral. It wasn't in rebellion, so their SCI will be reduced by one, okay? And increase the besieger side SCI by one, there. And I get 300 talents from selling slaves, one, two, three, and that jumps up to 5,100. Uh, one thing that's not written in here is uh, that I should gain 10 points, but I should gain 10 points. So, plus 10 for Amphipolis. You might be asking yourself, self, why aren't I tracking it over here? Because I'm still negative five, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> Because Nasea sucks. Arr, all right. Um, cool. All right. So now we have taken over Amphipolis again, which eventually will become Macedonian. But I digress. All right. We now have another siege over here. So the siege, again, I have, and we will go and bring this. Here. All right, so our force is down here in Preze. I do have a naval force bigger than his. So I'm going to add his tactical rating to my roll. So that's going to be a two, okay? So I'm going to add two to the roll, so anything two or higher succeeds. Boy, my, my, my guys are uh, really good at sieging. So it already had a ravaged marker, so we don't need to add another. So we just take the siege. 
If he had any forces, uh, he doesn't. Reduce the besieged side SCI by one. Increase my SCI by one. Increase this by 300 for the slaves that I've sold off. Uh, and I get another 10 points. Oh, hey, don't look now, but for the first time in history, I'm on the board. So that's going to be a plus 10 for Preze. And that force will now go there. All right, that's all the sieges. So now we're in the second going home segment here. And oh my, a lot of folks going home, okay? So how do you do this? Well, this is actually really, really simple for the most part provided places are under your control, all right? A combined battle is two battles, a naval battle and a land battle, two for the price of one. Huh. Well, then the rule book ought to be laid out differently, JT. All right, I stand corrected. So what JT said earlier is they are two separate battles. Okay, good to know. All right, thanks for the correction, brother. All right, so post-combat movement table. This is the going home stuff. So how this is going to work, this does not apply to leaders. Leaders are, don't go home right now. They're going to be skipped right now. We're going to separate them, hoplite, cavalry, and naval, and depending on whether they are Athenian or Athenian ally, they will go to particular places with certain rules assigned to them. So Athenian hoplites and Athenian cavalry will all go to Athens, and Athenian naval will all go to Piraeus. Okay. That's easy enough. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. And I think this will show you guys. Nope. I actually didn't have one saved for the going home. So I'm going to fix that. Give me just a second, guys. There we go. What do we want to do with that? We will put that there. Cool. All right. Now that we got that, there. All right. So Athenian naval will go to Piraeus. Athenian um, hoplites and cavalry will all go to Athens. So in other words, Piraeus, Athens. Easy enough. Okay. Because remember, they weren't destroyed over here in the battle. They just lost the battle and are going home. All right. So the leader stays there. So now we have, what do we have? We have uh, Spartan hoplites, which, any guesses where those are going to go? Yes, you guessed it, Sparta. All right. So let's take care of them first. So all four of them will go to Sparta. Okay, so now we have Spartan ally hoplite and Spartan ally cavalry left. And then we have the leaders, which will stay here for the end of the round. And in fact, those will be there, and we'll put them on opposite corners so I don't accidentally mess up Alcibiades. So uh, hoplite and cavalry. So hoplite, Spartan ally hoplite. 50% to Corinth and Thebes. However, it says, if Syracuse is a Spartan ally, it is, place SPs there until there are two present. So let's go ahead and take a look over here in Sicily. There we go. So there are already two hoplites already there. So therefore, we're going to skip that, move it on over, back to that. So there are already two there. Remaining SPs are appropriated or apportioned normally. If both locations are ineligible, go to uh, Jithium 
otherwise the SPs are eliminated. So in other words, Spartan allies, sorry, uh, up here, I'm looking at the wrong thing, I apologize. Spartan ally for hoplites, remaining SPs are appropriated normally. So Corinth and Thebes, half and half. Okay, easy enough. So there are a total of six. So now, now we get to have that fun again. Let's go back up here. Three and three. So there should be a total of six and three here. So there should be three here. And there should be a total of six up here. That's five. Hey, look at that. That's six. That worked out. Yay, done. Okay. So now, then we have one Spartan cavalry, uh, Spartan ally cavalry, Thebes. If Persia is a Spartan ally, ally uh, which it, I believe is due to the event earlier, right? Uh, let me check if that officially happened. A moment. Persia enters the war. I would say that's a yes. So I would say I should have put the Persian ally marker out there. But yes, the answer is yes on that. So Spartan ally Thebes. But if Persian ally uh, is a Spartan ally, place SPs in Sardis until three are present. Then place remaining SPs according to the normal procedure or priorities. Then, if either, da 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 da, Syracuse, but there already are two anyway, so then they would go to Thebes. If Persia is a Spartan ally, and Sparta has, I mean, they're giving me 500 talents a year, so yeah, all right. So I would say that the one um, cavalry goes into Sardis. Wow. Didn't see that coming. All right. No, you're fine, JT. I appreciate it. I want to get it right. Thanks, brother. All right. So that is all of the troops there for the going home. Does that make sense to you guys? Hopefully. So we're there. Now we're into the rebellion phase. Continued rebellion segment. Okay. During this segment, if a rebellion space is within the zone of influence of a friendly unit, in other words, here in Chios, here in Chios, the zone of influence of naval across naval communication is two. Zone of influence one, two, one, two. So it is within the zone of influence uh, and it's not within the zone of influence of an enemy unit. They have a range of one there. Uh, remove the rebellion marker. Cool. In other words, we put down the rebellion. Those go away. Nice. And then there would be rebellion expansion. Keep in mind, these are ravaged markers. These are not rebellion. Okay, those are different. All right, now we need to check for the Helot uh, Rebellion. So let's go back down to Sparta and Athens here. Okay, need to bring that down just a hair because it has to do with the area down here. Okay. If any of Pylos, Essene, Caron, Perese, or Epidaurus, uh, Lemura, are controlled by Sparta, this segment ends with no effect. This, 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 or this, or that. So those three and those two are still controlled. Four of them are still controlled by Sparta. One is controlled by Athens. If any of them are controlled by Sparta, skip it. Well, 
All right. So. Nothing happens. Okay. Done. Won't want. Rebellion phase. Done. All right. Administration phase. Hey, we get paid. Revenue collection and then unit construction. So we'll do this one at a time, as always. So revenue collection segment. All right. All right. Let's start with the game side. Sparta. Sparta gets a base of 2,500. Okay. However, they are also getting an extra 500 from Persia, so their baseline is 3,000 right now, okay? So, let's see, Sparta and Athens. Sparta has a base of 3,000 now, thanks to the Persians, and the Athenians have a base of 3,500 talents. Again, half a million dollars a piece in today's terms per talent. It's a lot of talents. All right, so, for Sparta, or well, for both sides, for every Ravage, Rebellion, or enemy-controlled space, they lose 50 talents. Talents. 50. So, we're looking at Spartan spaces that are Ravaged or Occupied. So here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve. That's 600. So that 3,000 is minus 600 right now. Okay. Then two, they lose 200 if Thebes is enemy controlled. It is not. They lose 200 if Corinth is controlled, enemy controlled. It is not. Plus 500 if Syracuse is allied. It is. And not enemy controlled. Well, that was a big battle they won, so they get 500 back. And then, either side will get 1,000 if Epidemos is controlled and can trace a path free of enemy units to its home space. From here, free of enemy units to its home space. It can. So that means Athens is going to get an extra 1,000 when we get to their side, which is now. However, Sparta had a base of 3,000. Minus 600 plus 500, net minus 100. They get 2,900 bucks for their side. 2,900 talents. 2,900. So we'll go 3,000, 1, 2, 3, minus 100. There we go. So they started with 7,000. They're at 7,500. That's cool. All right. Not bad. All right. So now we do the same for... Athens, 3,500 minus 50 per Ravage Rebellion enemy controlled space. That's 50 because that is a Spartan, or I'm sorry, an Athenian space. So that's 50. That's 50, so minus 50. Then, minus 1,500 if that's choked off from us. So you can see why that's such a huge deal. Minus 1,500, that's almost half of our money. But it's not. We can easily trace a path up there. Plus 1,000 if the player site is Athens and Piraeus, Panactum, uh, and Decelia have no enemy units or ravage markers. There, I'm sorry, try this again. If Panactum, Piraeus, and Decelia, all of those are free, so I get an extra thousand for that because it's player, player side. Plus a thousand if Syracuse is controlled and enemy, uh, or, er, yeah and friendly zone of influence every space in Sicily. So Sicily being Carena, uh, Messina, and all of these spaces right here are within uh, zone of influence of Athens. 
you would, I would get an extra thousand, or the game would get an extra thousand, but as it is, not. And get another thousand for Epidemus to be able to trace a path. So, 3,500 plus 2,000 is 5,500 minus 50, that's 5,450. So, 5,500. So, that's going to be at 10,000. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 50 more. 10,500. 10,050. Let's try that. There you go. All right. So now it's all about getting troops. Each strength point that you want to recruit costs 200, whether 200 talents, whether it is land or naval, even though activation is different. It's 200 for land, 400 for naval. For constructing, it's 200 regardless of what it is. The player side, so in this case, Athens, can spend up to 600 talents, three units. So now, what do we want? Well, and you place the SPs per the uh, movement table. So that table we just did, You know what? I need to look at that real quick to figure out what I want to recruit. If you guys have any uh, opinions here, chime in. I can't do any cavalry. So the question is, do I add hoplites or navy? I think naval, and we just ravage up here. I think I'm going to bring two naval. The two naval will go into Piraeus, and then I will do... I will do one more hoplite. Into Athens. So that's going to be 600 I lose. So that is... $9,450. There we go. Okay. However, for the AI side, the non-player side, can buy up to three units which were lost during the turn and cannot spend below a thousand. Well, this is why I set this one aside. So they must rebuild this one. Well, not must, but they're going to want to. So there, that's going to be 200. Um, and let me double check. They are allowed to buy two more, I believe. Let me double check. Nope. Only that which was lost during the turn. The same kind and in the same number. And if more than three, then they would randomly determine which of the three. So, they only rebuild that one unit, and therefore, they only spend 200 talents. There we go. Am I going back to Sicily? I think so. Yeah, I think, Angelo. I think that, that will be the plan. All right. So that is building all of the units. So now, the final phase is the uh, armistice and surrender phase. Bellicosity adjustment, surrender determination, armistice determination, then end of turn segment. All right? So I'm going to go through all four of those relatively quickly here. All right. Whoops. There we go. There we go. All right, bellicosity adjustment. In this segment, each side's bellicosity is adjusted. If a side's SCI is negative, subtract the value from that side's uh, bellicosity. So you take a look here. SCI is negative. Re reduce that to then. Same amount. Okay, done. It is positive on the, on the uh, Athenian side. If it's positive, add half the value rounded down to that side's bellicosity. 
that's a one. Half of that is a half, rounded down. So it doesn't change, it stays at six, okay? Count the number of league and coalition spaces belonging to a side that are currently captured, ravaged, or in rebellion. Captured, ravaged, no rebellion right now. Divide by 10, round down to the nearest whole number and subtract that value from that side's bellicosity. All right, captured or ravaged. So we don't need to worry about that for the Athenians. They don't have 10 out there. However, for the Spartans, captured or ravaged, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, divided by 10, I don't know if I counted that, it's not gonna matter, divided by 10, that's one point whatever, so they're going to reduce their bellicosity by one more. And that is the bellicosity adjustment, done. Now, surrender determination. Is either side's home space enemy controlled? No. Is their bellicosity zero? Close, but no. Okay, so no surrender. Armistice. If each side meets either of the following condition, their treasury is below 1,000 or the bellicosity of six or less. Three, six. So there's an armistice. It's the end. That's it, game ends immediately. Son of a, damn it. All right, if the game did not end. So here, here's something that wasn't clear to me, okay? I'm gonna run through the steps of the armistice. The game's over right now, I lost. But hold on, let's go through the steps of the armistice because this, this is implied, and I, it didn't occur to me until I was reading uh, threads on BGG this morning while I was preparing for this. I didn't understand part of this, but it all kind of had an aha moment. And you guys might think, duh, but it wasn't clear to me, so maybe not to some of y'all. Okay? How do you increase your bellicosity? Okay, before I go into the armistice, let's talk about that a little bit, Lawrence. So let's go back to the bellicosity adjustment. If a side's... SCI is positive at half the value rounded down to that side. Okay, so in other words, you need to have your SCI up at least two from the zero that it started. To be able to do that, win battles. When you win a battle, your SCI goes up one. So you need to win two battles more than you lose. I went two and one, which is only one, so it was only one, so therefore the bellicosity didn't move. Okay, now keep in mind, this is kind of the intro scenario for this game because you start in the meat of things already. Things are going on. Syracuse is in play and all of this stuff. Uh, there's already somebody up there in Amphipolis and all of this stuff. Whereas in the campaign game, it starts way slower. And so there's an armistice is okay. And it can only happen once per game. So it's not the end of the world. In this scenario, it is the end of the world. If you can't get your SCI, you better win two more battles. All right? So, okay. So now let's talk about what happens in an armistice. In this scenario, it triggers the end of the game. But if it weren't the end of the game, here we go. If so, if an armistice occurs, roll a die adding one if Nicias was the Athenian leader. Well, this is why we flipped this early on because Nicias was over here in Syracuse and he's there now, okay? So we would add one to the armistice roll, okay? Uh, so that is, do you roll both dice? No, roll a die, so that's a five. Add one if Nicias was the Athenian leader, he was, so that's six. Divide that result by two, so that's three. An armistice would now last three rounds. Okay, that means the round counter is going to advance three rounds. So if it were to happen in round six, skip, 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 go to 10. Not entirely skip them. There's still some things that are going to happen, but the majority of those rounds just aren't going, there's going to be a ceasefire essentially during that time, okay? That's what was not clear to me. 
But then, remove all Athenian and Sparta SPs, not allied SPs, but base SPs, so Spartan and Athenian, occupying captured spaces to their home or coalition spaces, according to the movement table. So in other words, like uh, Athenian ally would stay there in that Athenian space. But if that were actually a Spartan, he would actually have to leave because, hey, the allies, it didn't apply to them. It only applies to Sparta and Athens, okay? Allied units remain where they are. Spaces entirely vacated in this way revert control to the other side. That makes sense, okay? Then remove all hostage markers from the board. So if anybody, if anybody, if they had taken hostages, it basically uh, prevents each side from attacking their home spaces. Uh, re hostage restriction on attacking enemy home spaces is lifted for the remainder of the game. Roll one event for each turn of the armistice, and if it can't uh, occur because of the game state, don't re-roll. So in other words, if it went three rounds, we would roll for an event, if it happens, do it. If not, roll for an event. If it happens, do it. If not, roll for an event. Happens, do it. Okay? Okay. Um, then all rebellions remain in play but do not get spread. During revenue co uh, collection calculations, reduce the side's revenue for each space in rebellion. So you're still going to count revenue. Do an event and count revenue. Do an event, count revenue. Do an event, count revenue. For those spaces okay then each side constructs up to five sps though in doing so a treasury cannot drop below a thousand talents build whatever unit you choose for the player side the non-player side builds all their naval sps if sparta hoplites for athens that's backwards from what you would think but each side is realizing hey the Spartans are like, hey, I got to do something in the, with the Navy. And the Athenians are like, hey, I got to do something about the Spartan uh, army. Then reset both sides' bellicosity to 10 minus the number of turns of war that were fought prior to the armistice. So if this were the full game, so the armistice would have gone three rounds, but it would have been 10 minus 6. So each side's bellicosity when we come back would be 4. Do an event, get income and recruit. Do an event, get income, recruit. Do an event, get income, recruit. And now game back on starting with phase one with each side's bellicosity set at four and the SCI at zero. And then you do it again for the rest of that round. And that is how you play Peloponnesian War. I'm pretty happy with the way that went, even though, you know what? We had I had a better than 50% chance. Uh, I didn't do anything wrong in that. The die roll just went against me. Eh, it happens. That's all right. So, yeah. Um, obviously, a lot more fluid today than it was last week. And I feel like being able to walk through all of the steps like that, uh, even though it was a more concise, I feel like that was just, that was good. I still got tripped up, and I think people are still going to get tripped up when it comes to being able to make change. So the rules as they are, a moment, that's a lot of talking, hold on. It is a hard piece count, meaning no, uh, I can't think of the word, but if you don't have them, you can't put in subs for them. So because the scenario actually takes place here uh, in round six, right? In turn six, five turns have already gone. So a lot of the units have already been represented that they already have come out, been recruited, been on the board the whole nine yards. So that's why there aren't a lot to be able to make change for. Now, the Athenian cavalry has one shit in the entire game. That's it. So it's two. Or one if it gets one gets killed off so it's one chit so you can never make change for that but there are I mean there are more chits here okay but just the majority are out on the board so the things to keep in mind the things that trip me up early on right in my learning of the game is the player 
can always take whatever they want, meaning you can take the last of a unit, you can empty a city if you want, you, it reverts back to the other player if it's under the other player's uh, printed side. So keep that in mind, but if it's your own side, it's still yours, but you can, you're not uh, limited to what you can take from a space. That uh, messed me up a little bit. Um, the game is limited to leaving uh, one of each type unless it would cause them to pass for not being able to do their operation. In that case, you can take uh, the last of a type, kind of like what happened today. So keep that in mind. Those two things um, uh, might seem obvious, but it tripped me up a little bit. And so keep that in mind. There is a going home segment, a step after the movement and before combat. Even though there are interceptions and there are skirmishes and there may be battles from those things, which there weren't today, there were in the previous stream. Uh, there may be battles in which people go into the moving, going home box. Those troops, not the leaders, but the troops will come back out onto the board before the battle phase. That is very much intentional. And Mark has stressed that to me and he's explained to me the logic behind that. And so therefore, if you want to battle at a city and all of it's only your troops that remain, let me show you. So for instance, and let me zoom in here on a location. So let's say this, uh, you know what, let's go and move it over here. It's easier. So if let's say these troops had come into Corinth there and somehow destroyed all these ships and put them into the going home box. Okay. During the battle or during the movement phase, because of uh, interception or something like that, right? So let's say I destroyed those or maybe they got moved out, whatever. Just because I am there, I have not taken over the city. A battle is not a siege. It's a fortress. You have to siege. Even if there's no troops there, you did not take over the city. And the reason is, during the end of uh, movement, those ships are coming back. So now you have to have a siege determination. And if you're not going to siege, these guys are actually going to go home. If there is a siege, then there's going to be a siege. Fine. But keep that in mind. And that is something that really trips people up, uh, Marcus said. That has really messed people up in this game. So keep that in mind, okay? So hopefully uh, that clears up a couple of things that hopefully help folks um, when they're learning this and going through it the first time. Uh, normally I wouldn't do this, but what the hell. So I will show you guys some things that definitely helped me. So this is actually really good. Okay. There are two errors on it that I want to point out. The going home segment is 5.9 and not 5.4. There's that one. And this one, the revenue, uh, Oh no, I screwed up. That's not wrong. Ignore that. There's one mess up on this. It's 5.9, not 5.4. Sorry, Asher, if you're seeing this. Uh, so there's that. So the other things that are really, really invaluable that I messed with, where'd they go? What did I do with them? Oh, they're over here. The detailed sequence of play is basically all of those steps that I just went through broken down. And yes, I forget which is greater than and less than. Make fun of me. I can never remember. All right. So like this, I wrote down is page nine. And then don't forget the game. turn. This is not a all encompassing. And some of this is not always perfectly clear. But you know what? If you make little notes for yourself, um, so like, Switch sides uh, if the SCI is equal to or uh, greater than zero, and then do the roll of that. So like little, I mean, it's your own. Print it and make little notes um, for that, okay? So this is, it's a four page thing, so I did actually end up reprinting it, and there. But the combat phase is really good here. Naval battles, land battles. Then for uh, you guys, oh no. Drop frames. Oh, having an issue with the uh, internet. Let me show you all the chits that are in this game, unit-wise.
That's them. That's all of them. Uh, I mean, there's a bunch of ravage markers. There's a bunch of siege markers. And then there's other little markers like the Helot Rebellion. There's hostages. There's uh, the other stuff that's already out here on the board. But as you can see, it's actually a really small piece count game. Then there are all of these chits. You might be saying, wow, okay, hold on. There's a lot more chits here than I thought. No, no. These are for, I believe, the Persians. I think those are Persians for uh, scenarios or when they come into play. Same with, I think those are the Thessalians. I'm not sure. That's another ally. And then the black line with these. I'll show you guys these here. The black line edge ones and the yellow edge ones here are for specific scenarios. So you would use those as leaders instead of the leaders that we have already. So, but yeah, it's actually a pretty easy game to get into. And hopefully between this playthrough and if you want the more extended one, the other one, but I'll be honest, I'm pretty happy with this one. Uh, I think this will really help folks get this to the table more. I'm really hoping. So there we go. So that's it. Like, subscribe, support the show over on PledgeHC.com, and I will see you guys on Friday for the next stream. I'm Edward. You guys have a great rest of your day. Continue social distancing. Be smart. Take care of one another. Be kind to one another. And I'll see you guys later. Take care, everybody.